How many of you ran away from home at least once when you were a kid? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got stories, don't you? I bet we've got plenty of rebels who are part of this journey at home community. Now, here's the bigger question. How many of you went back home really fast? Yeah, you know why? Because we spent all of our time thinking about what we were running from, but we spent very little time thinking about where we were running to. We ran away without a plan for what we were gonna do. And we don't just do that as kids, some of us are doing that as adults. More on that in just a moment. So welcome to Journey at Home, where our goal is to make it simple for you to connect with Jesus. I am Matt, and if you're new with us, just do me a favor, hit that subscribe button, hit the bell for notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly content that is designed to help you live a better life. Now, while we can all laugh about running away from home, there's a more personal question I wanna ask you. Have you ever run away from God? And by run away, I just mean you've intentionally chosen to do something you knew God didn't want you to do, or you've intentionally chosen to go in a direction you knew God didn't want you to go. Doesn't matter if you're a Jesus follower or not, we've all done this, haven't we? Maybe you're doing it right now. You're in a relationship that you know God doesn't want you to be in, but that just kind of makes you want to stay in the relationship even more. Or maybe it's the opposite. You got out of a relationship that you knew you were supposed to stay in, or maybe you refused to change something in your life you knew God wanted you to change. Maybe you refused to follow a calling that you felt God had for your life. You just resisted, you rebelled. Most of us have done that at some point in our lives. It just looks different for us depending on our approach. Some of you, you're what I would call defiant runners. You don't care who knows about your rebellion, you just make sure it's public and visible. Others of you, you're a little more quiet runners you've kept your image up. You're still showing up at church. You're still going through the motions. But inside of you, there is a battle raging because you are being so resistant to God. And we all think our life and our story and our rebellion, we all think it's unique. But the truth is, history is full of runners. There's really nothing unique about our story. So in this three-episode series we're calling White Flag, I want to explore the story of one of history's most famous runners because there is a lot of our story in his and there are some valuable lessons that just might spare all of us some unnecessary pain. Now, whether you're a church follower or not, or a church person or not, you probably heard of Jonah. And when you think of Jonah, you think of a whale, right? And some of you are like, Matt, if you expect me to believe a man was in the belly of a whale and then lived to tell about it, I'm, I'm already out because that's crazy. All right, I, I get that. So here's what I'm going to do for all of you who have a hard time swallowing this part of the story. You see what I did there? For the purposes of this series, I'm gonna give you an out because you don't have to believe all of this happened the way that it says it happened to get the bigger message and moral of the story of Jonah. But I will tell you, I believe Jonah lived in the belly of a fish for three days and three nights. And the main reason I believe that is because Jesus said it happened. And when a man can predict his own death and resurrection and pull it off, I just go with whatever he says. But if you don't see life that way, it is no problem. You're gonna find inspiration and learning from fictional stories, from movies all the time, right? So just think of this that way if you need to. Now, a little backstory on Jonah before we get started. He was a Jewish prophet who lived in the 8th century BC, and prophets back then, well, they had a really tough job. Their job was to deliver a message from God to a group of people who were running from God, which means the prophet wouldn't usually get a very friendly reception. And that's where Jonah's story begins. Uh, the writer says, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. Now, let me familiarize you a little bit with Nineveh and the Assyrians. Nineveh was located where the city of Mosul, Iraq, Iraq is today. It's about 250 miles up the Tigris River from Baghdad. Nineveh was the capital city of the Assyrian Empire. It had a population of about 120,000 people. Now, the Assyrians, they were incredible warriors who were famous for their cruelty. As a matter of fact, their claim to fame was they had actually perfected the art of taking their enemies, skinning them alive, but prolonging their life as long as possible. That was their specialty. And oh, by the way, they considered Jonah and they considered the Jewish people to be their enemies. So imagine if you're told by God to march into the capital city of a people who hate your country, don't believe in your God, and enjoy skinning their enemies alive, and your job is to tell them, oh, my God, that one you don't believe in. Well, he said you're wicked, and you better change your ways, or he's going to judge you. It's not exactly a fun assignment, is it? So maybe it's not surprising that we read, Jonah ran away from the Lord, and he headed for Tarshish. 
He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. And after paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Now, when Jonah decided to run, you got to understand, he really ran. Jonah lived in Israel in an area that was known as Gath Hefer. Nineveh, it was about 500 miles northeast of there. But when Jonah gets his instructions from God, instead of heading towards Nineveh, he goes down to Joppa. He pays a fare to ride along on a ship, which is running a trade route exactly 2,300 miles west to Tarshish, which is located in modern-day Spain. And Jonah thinks his plan has worked. In other words, he's headed for the other side of the world, and God couldn't possibly stop him, right? Well, the story says, then the Lord, to which I'm sure everybody's like, wait a minute, I, I thought God was out of the picture. Jonah's thinking, I, I thought I'd manage to lose him with all my running. But the writer says, no, the Lord sent a great wind on the sea. Such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid. Each cried out to his own God, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. Now, you have to remember, these are not weekend recreational boaters. These are hardened, experienced sailors who run this trade route for a living. I mean, they've seen the worst the open seas have to offer. But this storm is so bad, it's got their attention. It scares them so much, they start praying to whatever gods they can think of to help them. Meanwhile, the writer says, Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. And so the captain went to him. The captain wakes him up and says, how can you sleep? You got to get up. You got to call on your God. Maybe he's going to take notice of us and we will not perish. To which I think Jonah thought, I'd rather God not take notice of me. So if it's all the same to you, I'm just going to lay low and skip the prayer meeting up top. You know, that's the whole reason I'm on this ship. The writer says, then the sailors said to each other, okay, come, let's cast lots to find out who's responsible for this calamity. Now, I wouldn't exactly suggest you use this method, but Back then, they basically draw straws to try to determine who is responsible for something bad happening. And so they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. It's kind of funny if you think about it. God ratted Jonah out to the other sailors. He made sure the lot fell to him. And so the sailors asked Jonah, well, tell us, who's responsible for making all this trouble for us? What do you do, Jonah? Where, where'd you come from? What's your country? From what people are you? And so Jonah tells them, I'm a Hebrew. I worship the Lord. I worship the God of heaven who made the sea and the land. So they asked Jonah, okay, well, what do we need to do to stop this storm? You caused it, so you tell us the solution. And Jonah says, well, just pick me up and throw me into the sea and it'll become calm. I know it's my fault that this great storm has come upon you. This is pretty incredible to me if you think about it. Jonah admits it's my fault, but I'm still not changing. I'm not repenting. I'm not going to stop running. I'd rather you just toss me in the sea. I'd rather drown than go to Nineveh. Well, these sailors, to their credit, they don't really like the idea of being responsible for a man's death. So they try to row harder, uh, but none of it works. And they finally say, okay, God, please don't hold us responsible for this. Um, it's really between you and Jonah, but we got to end this storm. And the writer says they took Jonah, they threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. So think about it. Suddenly the water's calm, and there's Jonah treading in the water, and there are the sailors going, well, should we throw him a rope and pull him back in? Eh, probably don't want to risk it, right? And off they sail, thinking Jonah's just going to end up dead. But that does not happen, because God's not given up on Jonah. The writer said the Lord provided a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish three days and three nights. And from inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. Well, I'm sure he did. I would have too. We all do once we're desperate enough, right? Now, in the next episode, I want to show you Jonah's prayer. Because if you have ever run away from God and then wondered if you could come back, well, this is going to be the prayer for you. But here's what I don't want you to miss. The point of this story is that you may give up on God, but God never gives up on you. You may give up on God. You know, I'm running. I'm buying that. I'm going there. I'm doing this. I'm living with him. I'm marrying her. I'm leaving church. You know, whatever the thing is. You may give up on God, but God never gives up on you. Now, if you're running right now, that might not sound like good news, does it? Because you're kind of hoping God will give up on you. You wish he'd just leave you alone and forget about you. But the truth is, it doesn't matter how far you run. It doesn't matter how badly you rebel. God never stops pursuing you. 
which at the moment may be annoying you. And you're thinking, why won't God just leave me alone? But I'm telling you, he loves you too much to leave you alone. He's doing what any loving father would do when his child runs. He's using all means possible to keep you from hurting yourself. Because while you're busy running, you are not paying attention to the fact that you're running to a life of consequences. You're running to a destination where you don't actually want to be. So you may give up on God. God never gives up on you. He's always pursuing you, not to pay you back. He's pursuing you to bring you back, to win you back into a relationship with him. And you know how I'm so confident of that? Well, because about 750 years after Jonah, God sent Jesus into the world to die and rise again to pay the penalty for your sins and for your rebellion. So God has no reason to punish you for what you've done. That punishment's already been taken by Jesus. God's just trying to offer you forgiveness, a restoration back into his family. So if you think you might want to wave the white flag and just go ahead and embrace God's grace and forgiveness for you, if you realize that running from God is not working, it's probably time to stop. Here's the good news. God really hasn't given up on you. He is waiting for you right now. You don't have to find him because you haven't outrun him. If you'll just turn around, guess what? You're gonna find he's right there waiting on you to come back so he can welcome you with open arms. So I just wanna invite you, if that's you, to tell God, hey God, I'm tired of running. I'm sorry I gave up on you, but thank you for never giving up on me. I'm just gonna wave the white flag. I'm ready to come back to you. I'm telling you, when you humble yourself enough to admit you need God's grace, you never have to doubt or worry about whether he's going to provide. He always does. And his message to you is simple. He just says, welcome back. Welcome home.